Today's sermon is entitled, The Seven S's of Being Ready. The passage I've chosen is 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, verses 1 to 11, the day of the Lord. My name is Reverend Derek Gilder. I'm senior pastor here at McKees Mills Baptist Church. And I want to say thank you. Thanks for taking time on your schedule. You know what? It's been an absolutely beautiful fall. And I hope and pray that you're praising God because the weather is amazing here in Canada. Ever since Jesus Christ gave us the words, he said, I'm going to go away. And I'm going to go up into heaven. I'm going to prepare this beautiful mansion for you. And when I get done preparing all these mansions for the believers, I'm going to come back again and I'm going to take you up there to be with me. Ever since Jesus has made this promise to us, we have been looking up. For over 2,000 years, we've been looking up into the sky, wondering if maybe possibly Jesus Christ would return in our lifetime. Now, I can almost understand the anticipation. There was a fellow in the New Testament named Simeon, a priest. And he was basically looking up, figuratively, so to speak. And he was saying, I can't wait until Jesus Christ, as a baby, arrives here on this earth. He was told by the Holy Spirit that he would get to hold Jesus in his lifetime. And he got to do that. Can you imagine how excited he was when he held baby Jesus? He must have been absolutely thrilled because he knew exactly why Jesus had come. He had come to save the world of their sins. And he was excited beyond all belief. Would we not be equally excited if we saw Jesus coming in the clouds today? We certainly would be. There are many reasons why we look up. I think there's two reasons, though, why we look up more often than we don't. And I got thinking about them. Number one, the more times that we have crises that we hear about, the more apt we are to look up. Jesus was clear. He said, you will know the signs of the times. And he gave us all sorts of different things that would happen. A lot of them were calamities. And he said, when you see these things happen, then you'll know the day and the hour is very quickly approaching. Therefore, make sure you're ready. So it's in calamities often that we look up, but it's also when we get a little bit older. I find that the older that we get, the more we look up, because the more like Simeon, we're hoping maybe possibly Jesus will return in our lifetime and we'll get to see him come in the clouds while we're still alive. What a glorious moment that would be. I, I think ultimately while hearing people like Jack Van Impey or Ronald Wheelan or maybe Gene uh, Dixon and others, when they come and they say, I know Jesus is going to return and here's the year that he's going to return. I know that can be really exciting especially when they use a whole bunch of scriptures and they back it up and say, these are the reasons why we believe Jesus is almost here. He's almost ready to come. Just be ready. Get looking up. Any moment he's going to appear. That can be very exciting. But at the same time, I think it can be very dangerous. The reality is, number one, it's very arrogant to think that we can pinpoint the time that Christ is going to return when he doesn't know the time he's going to return and not even the angels know when he's going to return. Only God the Father in heaven knows. So it's very arrogant for us to say, I know when you're coming, Jesus. You may not, but I do. Very arrogant. And number two, the problem with saying Jesus is coming right now and predicting the exact date of when he's coming is the fact that when we do that, we use a whole bunch of scriptures to back it up. And then when the date comes and it goes, people look at the scriptures and they start questioning it. They say, well, you were wrong on Jesus coming again. I wonder if any of those scriptures are wrong too as well. And of course, they're not wrong at all. We know that. It's just our reading of those scriptures were wrong. I got thinking that we've got to find a better approach when it comes to understanding the day of the Lord. In today's passage, Apostle Paul states that the date cannot be known and it's not meant to be known in any way, shape, or form. Therefore, stop speculating about the date. Paul's very clear. Now, I've got to realize this is almost 2,000 years ago that Paul's speaking to the, the people of Thessalonica and he's saying, don't speculate about the date. However, Paul says, be ready. Always be ready. He could come in your lifetime, Jesus Christ, but he may not. He may not come for many years later, but your goal and my goal as Christian believers is always to be ready. Well, the day of the Lord when he comes will be a day of judgment and wrath for unbelievers. For God's own, they will rejoice. For on that day they will receive brand new bodies. They'll spend an eternity in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. The following sermon is going to look at seven ways to be ready. Seven S's. And they go like this. It's going to come suddenly. There's going to be sorrow for many people. There's going to be a great sound. Some people are going to be sleeping. We've got to remain sober. Salvation's going to come to the believers. And we've got to take solace and build each other up in the faith. 
let's take a look at this. Let's unpack these verses and get an understanding of these seven S's so that we can not necessarily predict the date, which we don't know anyway and we can't know, but more importantly, that we can always be ready and be found faithful in front of Jesus when he finally does return. And I think that's the most important thing of all. Paul starts off and he says, S is sudden. That's the first S that Paul, uh, Paul uses here. He says, he's, Jesus Christ will come like a thief in the night. Paul told the believers at Thessalonica that he did not need to write about the date or the hour when Christ will return. Why? Because it cannot be known. Paul didn't know the date or the hour. The angels didn't know the date or the hour. Jesus didn't know the date or the hour. Only God the Father in heaven knows. Nobody else does. So Paul says, stop speculating. That's a waste of time. And like I said earlier, that's very dangerous to do so in the first place. We cannot fully understand the New Testament picture, though, of the day of the Lord, unless we go back to the Old Testament background. The day of the Lord in the Old Testament was to be sudden. And we find this in all sorts of different scripture, like Malachi 3, 1, Job 24, uh, 14, Joel 2, 9, and so on. And it was supposed to be seen as God's interaction or his decisiveness to come in and make things right in the world. Most prevalent from the time of Amos onward, the expression is used to refer to the time of God's judgment first upon the wicked and secondly, deliverance for all those people that are ultimately faithful. Paul took this tradition from the Old Testament that God would intervene in the future and separate the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, talking from New Testament language, but he would eventually do that, and he takes that Old Testament tradition and applies it to Christ. The New Testament writers, for all intents and purposes, identified the day of the Lord with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Since the timing of Christ's return was compared to the thief of the night, who was unknown and unpredictable, Paul implored the Thessalonians to be ready, to always be ready. Take their, their, their fervor to see Jesus Christ to return again and put that all into being faithful unto Jesus right now. In other words, live your life as if Jesus is going to come tomorrow or live your life also if Jesus is going to come in 50 years or 100 years time or even long past your death. Make sure you're always living for Jesus Christ. That was the point that he was trying to make. Paul said, make sure you're always doing God's will. And that way there, you don't need to know the date and the hour, which you can't know anyway, because when he comes, you will be guaranteed to be faithful. Whether you're in the grave or whether you're not in the grave, you'll still be found to be faithful because you always live for Jesus. That's the first point he wants to make. So Paul says, it's going to come sudden. Jesus is going to arrive suddenly. So you always have to be ready. His second point that he wants to make is sorrow. That's the second S. Sorrow. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 3 says, For when they shall say peace and safety, then suddenly destruction will come upon them. As a trial upon a woman with a child, so they shall not escape. False peace and security was one of the things that Paul wanted to tell the Thessalonians. Be very careful about this. You know what? The reality is, is that sometimes we can get fooled that we are secured and we are safe. And the reality is we may not necessarily be so. The only way we can be safe is if we love Jesus and serve him continuously. The day of the Lord, when it comes for those who feel secured in their safety and, and their peace that they have right now, based on their own efforts, is going to be foolhardy, Paul is saying. In verse number three, Paul sharply critiques the slogans and the propaganda of his time. Now, we've got to understand a little bit about history to understand why Paul put this in here. The reality is that in the Roman Empire, the time in which Paul was writing, that there was something called the Pax Romana. It was an era from Augustus Caesar in 27 BC to Marcus Aurelius in 180 AD. There was great political stability. There was cultural advances and military might in the Roman Empire that allowed people to move about freely. And a lot of people inside the Roman Empire felt that they were incredibly safe and they were at peace. In verse number three, Paul stated how foolish it was for unbelievers, even if they were a part of this Pax Romana, which they were, to think that peace and safety could ever be secured by their own efforts or by Rome's efforts. God in Christ is the one who brings justice, peace, and security once and for all, not the emperor and his slogans. He also goes on and says, you know, like Noah's time. Remember, in, in, if we go back in the Old Testament just for a minute to digress, you go back into Noah's time, and what does it say? They were eating, they were given in marriage, they were drinking, they were buried, they were living their lives as if nothing was ever going to happen. 
They knew that God had told Noah, there's going to be a great flood and a lot of people are going to die. Get your things right. Make sure you know God. Make sure you got a good relationship with him and you can be saved. But they didn't believe that. They felt they were right. They felt that they were doing the right things. And as a result of that, they just went about their lives, trusting in their own abilities and not in God. The same is true in Sodom and Gomorrah. They were wicked people. But ultimately, they didn't see any warning. Even though they were given warnings, they didn't recognize the warnings. And they continued to live their lives as if they were in peace and nothing could ever happen to them. Paul's trying to tell the people of his area, he's saying to them, don't feel like you have peace. You may feel like you got peace right up until the moment that Christ returns. But when he comes again, he's going to judge the living and the dead. Anyone found on that day not with the Lord will experience great sorrow and pain because for them, it's too late. It's way too late. They can't change their destiny anymore. They're destined to be separate from God forever. I read one of the commentaries that said, Paul's not talking about when he says judgment of the Lord. He's not talking about annihilation. Annihilation would be something I suspect the people would be very hopeful to receive because ultimately annihilation means you don't exist anymore. But as it is, Solomon talks about this and he says a soul that came from God will return to God and will stay in existence forever. For those people who experience God's judgment and they don't love God and they never recognize God and they're not God's children, they're going to spend an eternity, that means forever, in hell, separate from God and they're going to be tormented forever. This is what he's trying to say. Paul's trying to say to the church of Thessalonica, make sure you're ready, but also make sure the people around you are ready as well because nobody, not even God, wants them to go to hell. And God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. That's why it says in scriptures that he waits. He's not slow in coming. He's actually waiting in great grace, hoping that more people will get saved. And he knows exactly which ones, of course, will be saved and which ones will not be. Like the people in Noah's or Sodom's day, unbelievers of Paul's day felt that they had peace. But the reality is judgment was coming for them. Anyone found on that day not with the Lord is going to experience great sorrow. Paul is not trying to scare the Thessalonians at all. He's trying to encourage them that on the day of the Lord, they're not going to feel any threat. They're going to feel nothing but unspeakable joy because they're going to heaven to be with Jesus forever. But at the same time, Paul, I think, is trying to tell them Help the others. Tell people about Jesus while you can. While they're still alive and you're still alive and there's still an opportunity for them to come to know Jesus, tell them over and over again about the Lord Jesus Christ because sorrow is what they're going to get if they do not know Jesus on the day of his return. So that's really important. I think that's a really good point that Paul is trying to make here. Let's go to the next one. Sound. That's the third one. Sound. You are the children of the light and the children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness, 1 Thessalonians 5.5. 5. Christians ultimately know what they can expect to receive when Jesus returns again. In verse 4 and 5, Paul uses dark light imagery to reassure the Thessalonians that as children of the light, they knew exactly what they were going to get when Jesus came again. Darkness and light here is a really beautiful image. Now, when Paul talks about darkness and light, when he says darkness, Now, in the scriptures, that word is used, and sometimes it can refer to death. In other words, somebody who's in darkness is physically dead. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. When he talks about darkness here, he's talking about those people who do not know the Lord. They are in darkness. They are spiritually ignorant. They are under the rule of Satan. When he talks about the light, he's talking about those people who are born again, have a brand new nature, and have faith in the atoning sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Light and darkness for Paul pointed to the truth that some people are insiders while other people are outside of God's kingdom. Night for Paul was a time for thieves, whereas in daylight was a time for truth. For the thief in the night suddenness of Christ's return will not catch any believer off guard because they already have the Holy Spirit who seals them from the inside saying, yes, we are children of God. But for those people that are in the darkness, that it is going to catch them off guard and their destiny is unfortunately is going to be to spend an eternity without God. Since one cannot have fellowship with God while walking in the darkness, Paul implored the Thessalonians to not be careless or indifferent to what they have received, but always to be ready for Christ's return by putting on the armor of light so that they might be found faithfully walking in the very steps of Christ who purchased them at a price. 
In other words, make sure you understand the difference. Make sure you don't take your life for granted. I think, you know what, some days when we get up in the morning, we can take our lives for granted, can't we? Sometimes we get up in the morning, we think to ourselves, you know what, it's, it's another day. And we go through the whole day, next thing you know, the day's gone. You ever have that experience? And not once did we stop and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for another day. Thank you for granting me this day. Sometimes we don't spend enough time stopping and reflecting and asking Jesus, what can I do for you this day, Lord Jesus Christ? How can I honor this day by walking and talking like you? This is what Paul's trying to encourage the church of Thessalonica. Make sure you take that time to figure out, to figure out what you can do for Jesus at all times. He goes on and he says the next one is sleeping, the next S. Christians ultimately will be awake when Jesus comes again. Paul uses sleep, awake, drunkenness, and soberness as further images to encourage the Thessalonians to always be ready when Christ returns like a thief in the night. When a thief arrives, think about this for a moment. When a thief arrives at your house, ultimately if you're asleep, there's a greater likelihood the thief can come in and steal a bunch of stuff and leave. If you happen to be drunk and you're passed out, then there's even a greater likelihood the thief can steal even more, possibly in your own very bedroom, and still get out without you noticing at all. Paul says, make sure that you are not, in this case, make sure that you are not either asleep or drunk when it comes to your spiritual life. Make sure you profess the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in everything that you say, think, and do. He says, while sleep and drunkenness is natural to those perishing in their sins, Paul told the Thessalonians, as children of the light, they needed to be awake and to be sober at all times. To be drunk with the ways of this world and indifferent to the things of God is not acceptable because the believer's status as sons of the light demands a morality, a holiness in keeping with him who is pure light. In other words, we should not live our lives as if God does not exist. Isn't that a strange thing to say to Christians? But the reality is sometimes we do that. We live our lives as if Christ doesn't exist, as if Christ is not always watching us. If we're asked, we know it's very true. He sees everything that we do. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, the psalmist talks about this. And he says, where can I go where God is not? He's everywhere. He's indivisibly present absolutely everywhere. We should act as if God is watching us at all times. Not as a sense of, I'm going to get punished all the time, but a sense of, how can I love and please him all the time? Because he's my God. To constantly reject the views of those given over to the reprobate minds is not an easy task. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, yes, we can reject our culture. And I think we should do that. In Paul's time, it was incredibly important because they had a lot of Roman gods kicking around. And these, these Romans were always encouraging them to take on these other gods. We're in the same situation. There's lots of people in this world with many gods. And we're supposed to reject the ways of those gods. And we're supposed to take, stay awake and stay sober and always be looking at Jesus Christ and saying, what can I do? What can, how can I please you, God? Paul encouraged the Thessalonians that they will be found faithful only if they constantly hold on to God's standards by thinking of whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. Think about these things. Think about Jesus as you walk and talk in your daily life. This is incredibly important. And I can't help but wonder when we go through a whole day and you know it blinks and it's gone and we haven't once thought about Jesus or how we can serve him. Is that a day that's good? Is that a day that's honorable unto God? I don't think so. I think we should always be thinking about him and always looking for ways to be alert, to be sober, and to tell the world, you know what, I'm not asleep as a Christian. I really want to tell you about Jesus and everything that I do so that you might have a chance to be saved too and you might go to heaven as well. Let's go to the next S. Be sober and be alert. So the next S is sober. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love. Christians should always be alert. To be found ready when Christ returns, Paul recommends the Thessalonians remain sober by putting on faith and love as a breastplate and hope as salvation as a helmet. Though darkness was all around them, by wearing the right clothing, the Thessalonians could be sober, self-control, and walk in the light as God is light. Paul implored the Thessalonians to imitate God's example in Isaiah 59, 17, when he put on the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation before he went out and did battle against the ungodly. 
Faith and love helps protect the believer from the attacks of doubt. The helmet of hope helps protect one's faith. When life comes crashing down and when we feel injustices all around us, we really need to have that helmet of hope, that idea that, yes, Jesus Christ one day will return, and yes, he will right all the wrongs, and yes, we will get to go to heaven and be with him, and yes, we'll spend an eternity in great joy in his presence. By putting on the full armor of God, as found in Ephesians six fourteen to 17 the Thessalonians could remain sober and alert, conquering any conflict that the realm of darkness might ever throw their way. This armor was not to be put on so that they could sit in their houses with Bible in hand, though, and basically be paralyzed with fear. You know what? Sometimes when we think about the judgment of the Lord, that can be our response. Maybe we should just sit and do nothing. Maybe we should just be scared all the time. Maybe we should live in fear. But Paul doesn't say that. He says, instead, constantly walk in the light so that you might please Christ when he returns, whether it's immediately or sometime in the future. We have not been given a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love and hope. And Paul says, remember that. And spend your time, regardless of the coming of the Lord, spend your time always serving Jesus. He will come someday, yes. He may come in our lifetime. That's a very strong possibility. But he may not. That's a very strong possibility. We don't know. The only way that we can be found faithful is to remain faithful and always to serve him in everything that we do. The problem is we go out into the world, of course, and there's a lot of attacks. Paul talks about this. He says, you know what? You don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We as Christians wrestle against the principalities of this world. We wrestle against demons. We wrestle against Satan himself. We are no match for these evil things or these evil persons within this world at all. But with the Holy Spirit, ultimately, we are conquerors through Christ because Christ has already conquered all of them. So we must make sure that in everything that we do, we put on the armor of God, put that on all the pieces, and we get out in the world and make sure that we keep telling people about Jesus and we stop imitating the ways of this world. Let's go to the next S. Salvation. There's a really big one. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are asleep or awake, we might be with him. Once again, Paul reassured the Thessalonians that God did not appoint them to suffer judgment and wrath in the future, but rather to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how much Paul's done this. In these short few verses, he keeps reassuring the Thessalonians. When Jesus comes again, you don't have to worry about wrath. You don't have to worry about judgment. Jesus Christ paid the price for our sins. He paid the price completely of God's wrath because of the things that we have done. He says, when you look up, be thankful, be grace, be filled with hope. Understand the grace that you've ultimately received. It was God's initiative to send his son to die on the cross, John 3, 16, to live ultimately amongst us and to die for us. God poured his wrath upon his own son. He was angry at us because we sinned and fell short of his glory. We deserve condemnation. We deserved his wrath. We didn't deserve life at all. But Christ paid the price for our sins so that what we could not do, be sinless, or pay that price, Jesus did on our behalf so that we might know God the Father in heaven. To empty the serenity of God's wrath from salvation, though, is a real problem today. I think there's an awful lot of people who look at God's holy word, and because of so many people in the past talking about hell and brimstone, so many pastors, now they just look at God's word and say it's all about grace. Well, it is about grace. But the problem is one cannot understand grace unless one understands God's wrath. One cannot understand how much we have received, basically grace and forgiveness and love and, and, and so many things like every spiritual blessing of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't understand any of these things until we understand the incredible gap between where we were in darkness and where we are now in, in light. It's only because Jesus Christ pulled us up through our belief in him and made us into a brand new creation that we do get new bodies and we do get to go home to be in heaven. God has made uh, he who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Christ in his resurrection was the beginning of brand new creation. 
Paul did not say that salvation came independent of human action, but what he did say was by believing in the atoning sacrifice of Christ, then yes, we are adopted as God's children and we got to go to heaven. The fact that the return of Christ was nearer than when they first believed should not scare any of us. Paul was trying to tell the Thessalonians, don't let the fact that you're getting a little closer when Jesus comes again to scare you because you think judgment is coming. No, 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 don't worry about that. Feel incredible joy because those who are physically dead and those who are alive in Christ are all going to be carried up into heaven and go be with him forever. Salvation's beautiful. It's a wonderful gift that we've gotten. We are not saved by our works. We are saved by grace and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And praise be to God that he rescued us. Let's go to the next one. And this is the last one. Solace. The final S. So speak encouraging words to one another. Build one up, each other up in hope so that you'll be all together in this together. No one will be left out. No one will be left behind. I know you're already doing this, Paul says, but keep doing it. Keep encouraging each other. Having put on the armor of God and having stayed fully alert for Christ's return through holy living was to be both an individual and a communal goal. Within the bonds of the Christian community, Paul commended and also encouraged the Thessalonians to never stop comforting and helping each other to attain spiritual maturity. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. It'll be very sudden. Since no one knows the day or the hour of Christ's return except God, the only way that we can be found faithful as God's children is to always be doing what is right in his sight and never doing anything wrong. Even as alert, sober children of the light, wearing the armor of faith, hope, and love, the Thessalonians still needed the helping hands of other believers who were also trying to obtain the full measure of Christ. We actually need one another. And I love this in scriptures when it talks about this. It says, you know what? When somebody is weak, when somebody sins and falls short of God's glory, when somebody is caught in an habitual sin, we need other people who have been in that habitual sin and have found their way out through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, through his grace. We need to talk to them. We need to spend time with them. We need to encourage each other that, yes, there's no temptation that's, that's you know common to man that cannot be overcome through the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to get that message out amongst ourselves. Sometimes it can feel like sin is unbearable. Sometimes it can feel like sin cannot be beaten. Often when we go through habitual sins, we think, I'm never going to stop. But the reality is, yes, we can stop. Why? Other people have done it through the power of the Holy Spirit. So, so can we. That's great encouragement. And Paul's saying, share that with one another. Make sure you always know that. With all the trials and tribulations, persecutions, and injustice one has to inevitably face in this fallen world that's not our home, isn't it nice to know that we can get a helping hand from other people? Christ died so that the people, we, the people, might live, if we choose to. So, with great faith, and an abundance of grace, let's build each other up so that when Jesus Christ returned, we might hear the words, good and faithful servant. You know what? That's my only goal in life. I've been very uh, open and honest with people that have asked me. My goal in life is to hear those words. That's all I want to hear. Good and faithful servant. I gave you but one life to live. And the way that you lived it, sometimes it wasn't that good. But you did ask for forgiveness, and I forgave you of the things that you did that was wrong. But overall, you kept your focus on me, good and faithful servant. That's what I wanted you to do. That's all I want to hear. It doesn't really matter to me what crowns I may or may not receive. That's not why I run the race. I run the race, ultimately, like Paul, to see Jesus. I want to go to heaven and be with him. I don't know about you, but I don't want to face his judgment or his wrath. I want to feel his glory. I want to feel his presence. I want to feel his love. And I want to feel assurance that I'm going home to be with him forever. I hope and pray that's the way you feel. Now, if you're a born again believer, what can you take from this sermon? Not only keep yourself ready and don't be influenced by this world and don't sin like this world, but also teach others that time is running out, that we do not know the day and the hour. And as a result of that, they may not get tomorrow. The reality is Jesus could return tomorrow. He could come in the clouds. But again, at the same time, we've got to tell other people that they've only got one life to live. And the moment that their life expires, they have no more opportunity to say yes to Jesus anymore. 
Whatever decisions they made on this earth, either for him or against him, were permanently fixed forever in time. It will last for an eternity. So we as Christian believers got to live according to God's word, and we got to tell the world about it. Let them know that God still loves them. Let them know that, yes, they may have fallen short of God's glory, which we all have done, but God still loves them and still wants them to go to heaven. Absolutely. All they got to do is believe in Jesus. All they got to do is look up and say, I believe. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe he atoned for my sins. I believe that he is the son of God. I believe he's my creator. And I'm so sorry for all the sins that I've done. I'm sorry, God, that I've missed the mark and I haven't been living for you. I'm sorry, God, that I've ignored you all my life. But now I give my life to you. May you be my Lord from now and forevermore because I love you so very much and more importantly, you love me first. That's all this world needs to say. That's their prayer. That was our prayer that got us into heaven. That's their prayer. So may we live the word and may we teach them the prayer of salvation before it's too late and they don't have a chance anymore to say yes to Jesus. Amen and amen.